Um, hey, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Uh, so glad we have a lot of you attending today. This is a great topic. Um, but I just want to do some housekeeping first. We have um, Web Wednesday scheduled now through December, so or up to December. So keep joining us. Um, on November 3rd, we will have community options here. So they're going to talk about um, the services that they provide to our clients with brain injuries. Um, so yeah, keep joining. And if you would like a CEU request after today, um, by the end of the day tomorrow, there should be a request up in the same spot where you found the login information to get on today. And then the recording will be there as well. So um, we have Erica Ryder today with us. She's with the Department of Human Services. And her and I get to email back and forth a lot during the week. So she helps us a lot with managing everybody getting their their training hours in and all that so we appreciate all of her hard work with that and um we asked her to come back and kind of explain the resident res rehab and the community supports options that we have in north dakota so um take it away erica okay sounds good thanks carly um, so as Carly stated, I'm Erica Reiner. I'm one of the nurse administrators. I work with aging services under the Department of Human Services. So today we'll talk a little bit about residential habilitation and community supports. Um, still a fairly new and developing program um, across the state. And so still, you know, working on um, finding providers for the service. And so today we'll talk a little bit about um, I'll give you an overview of aging services and home and community based services, just a brief one, and then we'll go into the programs. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what those programs look like. And then also the agency adult foster home and how that fits in with these services, um, the rates for the services and then the provider requirements um, for someone for an agency QSP who would want to enroll. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so first of all, just a little bit of information regarding aging services. So really our purpose here at the division, um, aging division, again, under the Department of Human Services, our purpose is to administer home and community-based services, which help to allow older adults and also individuals with physical disabilities to remain in their own communities and their homes, and then also to protect the health, safety, welfare, and the rights of residents of long-term care settings and vulnerable adults in the community. So in this next slide here, this kind of gives you a just a snapshot of really what aging services core functions are. So um, we have various programs, various um, things going on throughout aging that you've probably heard of before or worked with before. Um, first of all, we administer the Older Americans Act services. So that funding, the OAA um, funding, federal funding that comes through helps to contract with local providers. So our senior centers and those nutrition services all fall under the um, Older American Act services and that's under aging. We also have the Family Caregiver Support Program, um, which helps to support, support family caregivers and then Lifespan Respite Grant, and then also provide direct services. So many of you have probably also heard of the Aging and Disability Resource Link, the ADRL. Um, there's been a lot of information about that, especially this year, since things um, really changed probably January 1st. So all, um, I I'd say it's the gateway into aging. Every, every service or any questions you might have about community resources, um, that can all go through our ADRL. And so even if you are thinking someone might qualify for home and community-based services or have questions on that, that's, that's where you would go. And so I'll have a slide in the end with that information as well well as how to um, access the ADRL. So that falls under aging services. Again, our family caregiver support program with the case management. Um, there's social work case management that's involved there. Um, the money follows the person grant, which helps to transition um, individuals out of the nursing home back into the community um, or long-term care facilities of, of any kind. And then um, long-term care ombudsman services um, where they are really there to protect resident rights. They go into um, skilled nursing facilities, our basic care facilities, and then our vulnerable adult protective services, which um, I'm sure you've heard of our VAPS reporting. So that would be um, another piece of our aging services. And then um, we also administer our state and federally funded home and community-based services, which is what I will focus more on today. Um, and our uh, Train or home and community based services case managers also fall under the aging services division as well. So these are our different 
programs, or sometimes we call them kind of funding pots. So th this is where, um, these are where our services lie. So there's the SPED or the service payments for elderly and disabled, our expanded SPED program, our Medicaid waivers, and then our Medicaid state plan personal care um, programs. And that's kind of how HCBS or home and community-based services is, is divided out. Um, and so if an older adult or an individual with a physical disability can qualify um, for services under one of these funding sources. Now this, um, I always think looks a little intimidating, especially if you don't live and work in it every day, but it just gives you a little bit of a breakdown of how um, it's determined how a person would qualify under one of these funding sources and then what services they could get. And so really that home and community-based service um, case manager is the one that's helping to determine the um, person's eligibility and which funding source they qualify under. But this is just kind of an FYI. So you can see it, our um, SPED program, a person doesn't have to be under Medicaid to qualify for that. Um, it's income and asset based and our, the resources for that person need to be 50,000 or less. And so it's based on a sliding fee scale. And again, that um, case manager would help determine, you know, if the person qualifies. So it's based on your financial eligibility and then your um, functional eligibility as well. They have to have certain impairments that they need to meet in order to qualify under SPED and then say that they qualify, then these are the different services that they could have under SPED. And so um, there's these different pieces, um, but today we'll really focus more on Medicaid waiver because that's where our ResHab and community support services fall. And so in order to qualify for ResHab and community supports, a person would need to qualify for Medicaid waiver. And so with that, they do have to be Medicaid eligible. They need to meet a level of care screening. So meaning they need to screen for that skilled nursing facility level of care. Um, so those are some of the big pieces just to remember when we're talking about Medicaid waiver today. So into our programs, ResHab and community support, Sorry, Erica, I forgot. That's you. okay. I was like, why am I muted? No, <laughs> they I was letting people in and it, sorry. Accidentally sorry. clicked it, no problem. Oh. Okay, um, so for our programs, ResHab and Community Supports, this is just a definition kind of that um, can give you a basic idea of what, what these programs are. So um, really it's formalized training and supports provided to eligible individuals who require some level of ongoing daily support. So that's kind of one of the keys here. Um, the person would need that daily support. Um, the service is designed to assist with and help um, develop self-help socialization and adaptive skills that improve that person's ability to independently reside and participate in an integrated community. So really helping that person live in the community um, in, the, in the best way um, possible with, with the most support that, you know, or the as much support as they need, right? So ResHab and community supports may be provided in a community residential setting um, that's leased, owned, or controlled by the provider agency. And we'll talk about that setting as well. So that's our agency adult foster care home, which we do not have any of those in the state currently. We have a couple um, working on this and interested. Um, but that is one of the settings these programs can be provided in, or it can also be provided in a private home. So, you know, in an apartment, private residence, um, that is another setting that, you know, ResHab and community supports can be in. And it's really meant to be a higher level of services and all inclusive care. It's meant to kind of encompass all, if any of you are familiar with HCBS and home and community-based services, it's kind of a breakdown. You know, you get your personal cares, you get your homemaking. Um, and it's kind of pieced together based on your needs. And so this is meant to be all inclusive for those that really need most, you know, most if not all of the services that we can provide in there. So first let's talk about residential habilitation. We talk about both of them together because they're really um, a lot the same, but there's a couple little differences. And so at the state level and the case manager level, um, it's determined which program a person falls under. So this just gives you an idea of what, what we're kind of looking for. So under ResHab, um, the person would need to be Medicaid eligible, like we talked about. So then they would need to fall under our Medicaid waiver um, services and, and under that funding pot, right? So 
um, they need to meet skilled nursing facility level of care, like we spoke about before, and then have that daily need for services. And it can be up to 24 hours per day, but it doesn't have to be that. So some people that are currently on the service, you know, maybe they need eight hours per day, um, just depending on that level of need. So it can be up to 24 hours per day. Supervision really can't be the only need. There has to be a need for other pieces, other services in there besides just that supervision. The person can, um, so they, they can live alone or if they don't live alone um, with an individual who is not capable or obligated to provide care. So what does that look like? So the person can qualify if they live alone or say that the person has maybe, um, they're living with like a son or a daughter that works every day. Um, they're really not able to take care of um, that person all day long, you know, um, and maybe that's what that person, that individual requires. And so we can look at some of those cases as well. So if there's um, still a need for this, this service, even though they live with someone that doesn't, um, doesn't exclude them. So I think um, that's an important thing too. So obligated is really defined as a legal spouse. So technically a legal spouse under the law is obligated to provide care, but say they're not capable, that'd be another way we could, you know, look at the service. So um, I think that's an important piece. And that's, again, something that would be determined by that case manager. And then at the state level too, we um, would review those, those situations. And then um, part of the goal is really to assist with socialization, skills training and restoration. Um, so there should be some type of an educational piece to this, right? It's it's residential habilitation, kind of like rehabilitation. So looking, looking to improve something, working on some kind of a skill. Um, maybe a person's on res hab services forever, um, but but you're always working on skills training or you know some type of restoration. Um, they could still fit under res hab. Um, so the the idea is really that we are trying to serve. Um, our target population would be the traumatic brain injury, a stroke, or maybe early stage dementia. So under ResHab, I think one of the other important pieces, and I'll point this out in a bit again, um, is that a person that qualifies here would really have more of that um, cognitive um, piece that they're in need of versus, you know, more the physical dependency. Um, so someone under this program would need a lot of cueing, maybe more guidance and reminders, and maybe physically they can do tasks, but, you know, mentally they just need that extra cueing and reminders to, um, to do their daily, daily tasks. So this um, shows you a little bit of the, an idea of what, what tasks can be included in ResHab. So um, the activities can include like adapt adaptive skill development. So any education and training, like we talked about, maybe it's helping them, you know, learn how to take their medications, make meals, um, go to the grocery store. I mean, working on those skills and training to um, be able to be more independent. Assistance with activities of daily living and the IADLs as well. So personal cares, homemaking, um, medication management and med administration are included under here community inclusion and social and leisure skill development. So um, taking them out into the community, if you know maybe they're socially isolated, they really don't get out into the community, they have that need, the provider can also um, do that piece under ResHab. So say that they're interested in going to a baseball game um, every now and then, or getting out to the movie, or you know those, those types of things that are more the social um, side, they, that would be something we would allow for and include um, in the person-centered plan when looking at this service. And then also a protective oversight and supervision. So time is allowed for that as well. So if that person really needs supervision, they can't be left alone at night. Um, that would be additional time that can be allowed under ResHab. And then the care coordination piece is also um, considered the responsibility of the provider. So say the person has a lot of medical appointments, um, that can also be included under ResHab. They could be taken to those doctor appointments. They could be, um, time can be allowed for care coordination in that piece. So just a picture of maybe someone who would um, be under the ResHab program. Um, maybe the person has a diagnosis of a traumatic brain injury and their service needs could include personal cares. Maybe it's more cueing. They can complete the task, but they need reminders. They forget 
you know, to take that shower every day, to get dressed, change clothes, those things. Um, homemaking, medication administration, so that includes queuing. Say they they maybe know how to take them, they just need that reminder, um, or they need someone to set up the medication. Grocery shopping and assistance with meal planning, um, the social integration and community inclusion, like we talked about. Say they're interested in going to a baseball game, or you know they want to get out to the mall to go shopping. That's something they really enjoy. We can include that. Um, in our person-centered plan. And then medical coordination, say the person has frequent medical appointments um, and that provider uh, needs to assess them and scheduling and taking them there, that can be included. So say this person, um, maybe we came up with an average cost or an average total of um, six hours per day with a daily rate. Um, so how it, how it goes, so it's six hours, say it's six hours per day times our daily rate. So our daily rate is $37.06 per hour. Um, and we also look at this based on units as well, but this is just kind of an estimate to give you the idea of how much it might, you know, um, the provider might be paid. So $222.36 per day. So that'd be a daily rate. So the provider then comes and goes, um, say one day this person needed six hours of care and the next they needed four. Um, it can be kind of flexed and, and changed based off of that person's needs. And again, this, this rate is really um, driven by what's assessed by the case manager, what that person really does need um, for services in the home. So on to community supports. Um, like I said, this is really essentially um, the same service except for this one is more for our maintenance care, more custodial care. So someone that's really physically dependent, um, that really, you know, maybe mentally they like know how to do the task, but they just physically can't anymore. They have complex health needs. Um, they might fall more under the community support side of things. So again, the person would have to be Medicaid eligible um, be under Medicaid waiver, and then meet that skilled nursing facility level of care. They'd have to um, have a daily need for services, which could be up to 24 hours a day. The supervision piece they can have, um, just can't be the only need. And again, um, with the live alone piece, they could live alone, or maybe they live with a person who's not capable or obligated to provide care. So we can consider that those cases as well. And then um, the target population here, like we talked about, is really more physical disability, um, someone with more complex health needs. So often um, what we've seen so far is maybe it's someone with um, MS or, you know, um, just that high physical need. Maybe they had a bad stroke in the past, which left, left them paralyzed. Um, and in those kind of cases, that's, that's how this one looks. So maybe they need transfers with a Hoyer lift or just really are physically dependent, they would fall more under this community supports. So the service tasks and activities, it really looks the same. Um, you're assisting except for, I guess I should say, except for the um, education piece, right? You're not really working on skills training, but maybe, maybe the medications, maybe there's something you can still do some teaching on, but really it's more you're physically doing all these tasks for them. Um, the tasks, you know, would be the assistance with activities of daily living, your IADLs, all of your homemaking, um, personal cares, community inclusion, and that social leisure, leisure skill development, again, protective oversight and supervision, our med management and administration, if they need that, um, and then the care coordination, again, can be included in this service. So the same, same idea there. Um, a picture of someone that might be under um, community supports, maybe they had a stroke, which left left them really physically dependent. So the personal cares, they really need someone to just do it all for them, right? Help them bathe and dress. Um, they really can't participate a whole lot. So they need that, that um, caregiver to assist them or that support person. Homemaking, they physically can't do any of it. So um, that can be included in the service. Medication management, they need the full assistance. They can't open the bottles. Um, and they need someone to administer the medications. Grocery shopping and making meals, um, the social integration and community integration, say that person wants to get out into the community. Of course, it'll depend on the agency that can do this work. Um, some I've, I've um, heard that have like a van that they can take the person out in. Otherwise, you know, it might involve scheduling transit and then that caregiver meets the person 
there depending on how how much um, care they need, how much you know it takes for a transfer and if they can get in and out of a vehicle. Um, but that piece could be included, that time is included in, in this service. And then assistance in going to the medical appointments, um, transportation and care coordination can all be wrapped up in this. So say this person had an average of the eight hours a day, we take that times our daily rate. And so someone in this case could be um, $296.48. That would be our estimated daily rate for that person. So just to give you an idea here again, how they differ, community supports versus ResHab. Res um, ResHab is really that skills training in order to assist that person to independently complete tasks. So an example could be menu development. They're creating a grocery list for shopping and that support person is really helping, helping that individual come up with this on their own, right? Um, under community supports, there's no training. That person really just physically isn't able to complete the task. Maybe they can make um, a meal, they know how, but physically they just can't do it. Um, so they need someone to do it for them. It's more that maintenance care. And in some cases it is a little gray, you know, they may fall under one or the other. And so again, that's, that's for us to determine on our side, the case manager would help determine it. You know, we, we would just know they probably qualify for one or the other, right? So we would look at which one is more, uh, makes more sense. Okay, so on to the service settings. So where, where can these services be provided? So we talked a little bit about that in the beginning. Um, it can be a private home or an apartment. So where that person lives, um, sometimes maybe a workplace or other community service settings that that person goes to. So of course, at medical appointments, if they need a person there, we have had cases where a person does um, work and they just need assistance getting set up. Um, you know, but physically they need all of that care um, to get up in the morning and get ready. Um, those types of cases you, we could do um, that work and, and help take them to the workplace. And then also the agency adult foster home. So as I stated before that, um, we don't have any developed yet. And so um, that's in the works. Hopefully there will be a couple in the near future. Um, but really the idea is that this is a a home, a private home that's purchased um, by a qualified service provider agency. So a home care agency, that's a QSP um, that purchases that home and it's considered a controlled shared living environment. So that QSP agency hires staff um, to take care of people who qualify for res hab or community supports um, in that home. And so it would be only Medicaid recipients that could live there. And in this next slide, um, we talk a little bit about more about it. It's up to four people. So four adults that qualify for res hab and community supports. They don't have to be receiving 24 hour care. Um, they just have to qualify for these programs. And so it would be um, again, Medicaid only the home would be licensed. So by, by aging services, we would license that home, um, based on the, um, under the law, the requirements under the law and, um, the person, some of the people could be getting 24 hour um, per day care. Again, it's supervision cannot be the only need. It's the same, same requirements for res hab and community supports as far as the services go and the qualifications because they have to be receiving those services. Um, but then the home is also licensed. The HCBS settings rule do apply. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with that, but um, that's um, from CMS, from um, them as far as um, the where it's um, governed over. Anyways, the settings rules really help to ensure rights, choices, options, and opportunities while living in an individual's home and community. So really, we're looking at, you know, does that person have freedom of choice to um, come and go as they please? Do they have access to food at all times? Do they have the ability to lock their door in their room? Just some of those kind of things. And if not, why? You know, what is there a restriction in place because of safety concerns, um, that type of a thing, and that would have to be documented. So the settings rules are another piece of this that would um, apply to those living in that, in that type of a setting. And then the case manager, the HCBS case manager completes the on-site assessment for the licensure. And so um, there is a agency adult foster care handbook. And so um, the link is here and I can um, try and get those slides out to, 
uh, to Carly too, so that they can be sent out in the end here. Um, and there's also an administrative code. And so in that code, it really explains all of the requirements for the home. Um, you know, there's certain, um, uh, like the rooms have to be a certain size. There's, you know, the requirement for handrailings on both sides of the stairs, um, requirements for the kitchen and the bathrooms. And so all of those things are listed within that administrative code. And that's what that licensor, what the case manager would be looking for um, when doing the licensing of the home. So it's really a lot like our um, foster homes, that piece of it, the licensing, but there's additional um, because it's an agency foster home. So there's kind of a higher level of um, re requirements there. And so for our rates, um, the rates for service, and we talked a little bit about this, um, the direct service rate. So for the Res Hub and Community Supports programs, that daily rate is $37.06 per hour currently. And then the maximum is $889.36 per day. So someone that's receiving 24-hour care, that is the rate, the $889.36 per day. And so that's based on um, the highest nursing home level of, or highest nursing home rate of care in the state. And those rates get adjusted annually. The agency foster care, say that um, an agency had a home, the room and board would be another piece um, for the rate. And so the um, Medicaid does not pay for the room and board. That piece would be um, responsibility of the recipient. So the, the um, individual receiving the services there would pay room and board. And so that would be um, set up by that QSP agency and they'd have a lease uh, rental agreement with that person. And they could charge um, up to $766 per month. And that rate's also adjusted annually. So there is a maximum they can charge or they're not required to charge room and board at all. Um, and they may also choose you know, less than that too if they don't wanna charge that highest rate. And then again, that room and board is paid for by the recipient. Um, the home and community-based services case manager completes the assessment to determine the number of hours and the rate that will be authorized. So that's important here too. Um, it's really based on that case manager's assessment with that um, individual, with that client, if they have a guardian, that um, amount of care is based on that assessment. And so it's not something that can be negotiated by the provider. So a little bit about the case manager role. We talked um, quite a bit about that. So they do the functional and financial assessment to determine eligibility for services. Say a referral came in through the ADRL, um, then it would get assigned to a case manager depending on how that person screened, if they would screen for home and community-based services that they could pot potentially qualify. Um, by that ADRL worker, then that um, information would go to the case manager in their area, in their zone or their um, county area. And so then the assessment would be completed. And then that consumer, that person gets to choose, you know, the services that they really want and the provider. And the case manager determines the number of hours, which are based on that functional need again, and they help to establish the rate cannot be negotiated and the provider themselves um, can determine which clients they want to serve if they have the staff to do it, right? So that's obviously an issue across the state um, staffing. So they can determine if they'll take that case. And then the case manager receives approval from the state um, program administrator. And they also conduct the follow-up and make care plan adjustments as needed. And if there's any new issues with the um, case with that person, then the provider would contact the HCBS case manager to um, discuss it further, to troubleshoot, maybe they need more hours depending on the situation. So a little bit more about our provider requirements. So in order to do the service, um, and currently I should mention, I believe we have 11 that are enrolled, 11 QSP agencies that are en enrolled to do this work but definitely in need of much more, especially um, when you look at individuals that need 24 hour support, right? So then you really um, need that staff to do that work. Um, as we mentioned before, there's um, definitely a staffing shortage across the state, but that would be, um, we, we do have some providers already doing this work. So um, just wanted to mention that part. So they do need to be a QSP agency. Um, they have to be accredited by what's called the Council on Quality and Leadership, so CQL. Um, and this is the same accreditation that the Developmental Disability 
providers have to have as well. So some of those providers have become ResHab providers uh, because they already have a lot of the pieces in place. And that CQL accreditation is a big part of it. Um, and I'll go through that a little bit in a minute too. And then they have to have the brain injury modules. So all caregivers, all, all staff um, that will be providing any support to those um, clients, they would need to complete two modules through the North Dakota Brain Injury Network. And we would want those completed every two years. And they can register through the UND Canvas site. And there's some instructions. So say an agency was interested, I would send all this information to them. Um, and Carly and I communicate regularly, as she said, um, regarding these modules. So those are through the North Dakota Brain Injury Network. Very good information anyway, even if you're not a, um, not looking at becoming a provider. There's quite a few modules in there and it's really good, good information and education. Um, there's dementia training modules and currently we're working on um, changing the training to the Alzheimer's Association. Right now we have a purchased contract through what's called CARES training modules. So Anyway, um, there are some training modules that are required, and I would provide those to the um, QSP that's interested in, in doing these services. And then the Minot State Medication Modules, those are um, the, there's a test, so um, there's some information that the person would need to study first, and then there's a test that they take, a written test um, that they need to pass. And then the agency RN would need to sign off on a practicum. So actually observe them or go through the practicum um, and sign them off that they're okay to administer medications, that that caregiver can do that work. Um, so with that, an agency would need to have an RN. So either it's a person that's employed with or a contracted RN, um, because maybe they don't have a need for the RN all the time. Um, but for that training and some of the medication oversight, they really do have to have that RN in order to do this work. So again, must employer contract an RN and then also name an agency program coordinator. So that nurse could be the program coordinator. And there's also some qualifications otherwise, if it's not a nurse and I'll um, point those out as well here in a minute. So as far as the CQL accreditation, um, there's four different levels of accreditation. And CQL assists in determining the level you will begin at. So each agency, you know, might start at a different level. If it's a brand new agency, they might march, might start at um, the systems accreditation level, which really what CQL does is assists that agency in um, developing policies. And they're really looking at that system. And if you have policies in place to support what you're um, looking to do, what services you're providing. And then there's what's called basic assurances. And so at that next level of accreditation, they're looking at both policy and procedure. So how are you carrying out your policies? Um, and they're looking at safety. You know, it, it reminds me a little bit of joint commission type of um, what they're looking at, but also um, one of their biggest focuses is the person's rights and that individual's rights. And are they, um, you know, living in the most integrated setting? Are they able to have a say in what care they have um, and they're given and then um, just multiple different probes is kind of how they explain it um, that they go through so it's sort of like a survey but it's also more um, them working with you so every agency really comes away with things they have to work on um, so it's not like you pass or fail necessarily it's just that you know you, there's always something to work on right and it, they're working or really focusing on quality improvement so um, again, CQL works with that agency. There's a request for engagement form that you would send in if you were a QSP agency interested, and then um, they could begin working with you. Um, and there's also a link here too as well. As far as staff requirements, um, additional requirements. So uh, we just wanna make sure and point this out as far as a QSP agency goes, there's also um, a documentation of competency. So if it's a CNA that's working, that's a caregiver, um, they might have different requirements. They probably meet all of the pieces on a documentation of competency, but there are requirements through provider enrollment um, that need to be met as well for, for any QSP agency. So there's required checks and validations, court sites, um, no direct um, barring offenses, some of that's background check information that needs to be 
um, checked over as well. And that's included in our agency QSP handbook. Um, the TBI and dementia modules. So say that um, this has come up quite often. So say that not all staff are trained right away on hire, uh, but you need someone to take care of, um, you know, this person that needs 24 hour support, right? So uh, the, the caregivers really do have 30 days to complete those modules. We want them done within 30 days of providing care, of starting that care. And then the med medication module testing and practicum would need to be done prior to any medication administration or touching the meds at all, or within, um, within 30 days, say they're not doing any medication administration, they still would need to get that completed right away if they're providing any services to ResHab or community supports individuals. And then the nurse in that agency would be responsible to complete the practicum and really sign off that that person's been trained. And that might include going to the home of this new um, person that signed up for these services and looking through the med list and making sure they administer. I shouldn't say that might include, that would include, right? They need to make sure that that employee can, can really administer those medications because it's a big responsibility. And so that's why that RN is required. We really want that oversight um, of that piece of it. And then another piece that um, we recently added, just because this has come up, um, the agency cannot employ a legal guardian or a family member to provide this level of care. There's other services for family caregivers if they would like to be paid to provide care, but not under the ResHab and Community Supports Program. And then the QSP agency program coordinator, that, that's another requirement for the agency. Um, that coordinator must have at least a year um, of experience working directly with a person with physical disability. And I know this is a lot of information, but um, a person could be a registered nurse or they have to have a bachelor's degree, basically. It doesn't necessarily have to be a social worker, though. It could be someone with any type of a bachelor's degree. And maybe then they would just complete the TBI dementia modules um, and make sure they have the medication modules as well. So those are some of the things we'll look at with the coordinator role too. Um, and then the role, so the actual role of that person um, is to meet with that individual to, to determine if needs may be met. Maybe that's working with the case manager and meeting with the person together um, and develop what's called an individual program plan and submit that to the case manager for review. So they do have to come up with a program plan. Um, and we have examples of what that might look like as well. And then they would sign the authorizations or acknowledge them within the therapy case management system. They're, they would be responsible for all of that. They're really the one kind of like the gatekeeper for that case manager, the one to communicate with regarding any changes in the um, client's needs. And then they would be documenting cares according to the protocol. They, they might also be a big piece of the care coordination, right? So the coordinating the medical needs, they might be the one communicating with the families. Uh, managing property, maybe budgeting and money, they might help with that piece too. Um, so they're really kind of responsible for kind of overseeing all the care, probably the staffing, all of that. So often an agency already has a coordinator in place that would um, qualify. And then um, the individual program plan I briefly mentioned. So that's what is developed by that um, QSP agency coordinator. And then they would keep it in the client's file um, and that would really coordinate with the case manager's assessment and what kind of goals that person has, really what services you're providing um, and how you're doing it. How, how are you doing the medication administration? It really just explains it's an overall picture of what, what services and supports you're providing to that person. So the agency is required to submit one of those um, an IPP within 30 days of starting care. Whoops, this piece, um, I don't want to skip over. So I just want to mention too, um, and if you if you're familiar with Jake Ruder, he has probably sent out um, quite a few emails with this information. But there are some upcoming grant opportunities, and so um, as you can see here, the Department of Human Services is looking to support the development or expansion of QSPs, qualified service provider um, agencies, through a competitive grant process. So um, these grants are being made available to for the purpose of finding, um, providing funds necessary to either start a QSP agency or maybe expand the services of a current agency. The expanded capacity of the QSP agency will enable 
um, individuals to transition from institutional settings and or with supports and services they need to continue to live successfully in the community. So we're really looking at people who maybe want to provide ResHab or community supports, who want to open an agency foster home, or maybe you want to expand um, nursing services. There's um, extended personal cares. There's a list of, of different um, things we're kind of looking for. So anyway, um, the QSP would be required to provide services to people receiving Medicaid or one of the state-funded home and community-based services uh, administered by the DHS or by DHS. And then their grant awards are um, up to $30,000. And so we have money to assist 10 or more, depending. Um, and then the funding will be available until all that money has been allocated. So no grants more than 30,000. So if anyone's interested or hasn't received that information, I can definitely send that out too. Um, really important, we want to get that information out because we can have these great programs, but without the providers and the people to do the actual work, it's not um, as valuable as we would like, right? So we really are looking for more QSP agencies to um, either expand or be developed. So that's my little spiel on that. And then um, I also have my information here too in these slides. Um, you can always feel free to contact me if there's questions. Um, and then I too have the ADRL information up here that we talked about. So really that's a great resource for anybody. Um, even, you know, someone, if it's your family member, some, someone like that even, um, just to call that number. If you have questions or we're wondering about community resources, maybe there's a program they qualify for. Um, we have what's called options counseling and you know that social worker can come out and even see if there's anything that the person might qualify for. So various services available that um, might be helpful. All right, so I think that's the end of my slides here. So now we can probably open it up for questions. Yeah, so if you want to unmute and ask, or you can type in the chat and I can field those. Really well presented. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of great information. That is a lot. Thank yes. you. Thanks. Yeah, kind of a mouthful, right? <laughs> yeah, but you did it so well, Erica. Uh, I, I did write down your email address. You are just nifty. I see <laughs> email all, all the time. I love Carly. And I was going to say, Erica, is just, uh, she's a heavy hitter right there. That was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I don't have any questions. I'll be quiet. Now. Are you all going <laughs> to apply to open up an adult group home now? Okay. Yes. Yeah. How right. we doing it, Carly? How we doing it? Mm -hmm. oh, we really, really need one in North Dakota. We do. Yes, we yeah. do. More than one. We need a lot. But we're yes. hoping with the grant. Um, I mean, even to help start it, right? There's there is a lot of cost to begin, uh, obviously, too. So hopefully, though, the grants there's might so help. There's so many grants out there, Erica. Mm -hmm. There's so many grants, Carly. Mm -hmm. Like I love writing nonprofit grants. Like just put me to work. Tell me what to write. I'll do it. <laughs> right. Seriously, I want to. I want to yeah. help with this. I I believe in it so passionately. Mm -hmm. And finding oh. the people to do the work, right, is the, yes, is the challenge here, across the state. You know, oh, yeah, there. Okay. Sorry. And I should say, too, Envyvin is, is around for training opportunities, you know, like some of those res have people that we've transitioned out of um, out of the state hospitals. So they've so. helped with the agencies that have picked up those clients and helped them get ideas on what to do with that individual and how to handle behaviors and we can we can try to help support you in in whatever capacity you feel like you would need with that. Um, yeah, I think that's huge, Carly. That you guys are able to offer that um, like a consult and right. look at, yeah, look at the overall plan. I think that makes the agencies feel a lot better too to have that support. So Good. we're really happy to have that partnership for sure. As they're the best brain injury network in the nation. <laughs> Oh, you're so sweet. But it's true. I mean, I'm not even being nice. I'm just <laughs> true. 
it's it's a fact. Oh, well, any questions? No questions. Should I so send? So oh, thorough. Yeah, if you want to send me slides, I can put the slides right up next to the CEU request and the recording as well. Perfect. So that way okay. People can click on links and and that I'll, kind of stuff. I'll give you the grant information too, in case some don't sure. have it. It in case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Rebecca, any thoughts from you or any? No, I know I've I've forwarded the grant information on to a few. Hey. Um, <laughs> You probably taken care of that already, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew how to mind, um, you know, and it is something that I believe in the grant, there is preferential treatment for, or like, yes. if you're, you know, so this was an area that is identified as like a need to where you would get like more points extra yes. on your grant. And I think particularly, um, the accreditation is a piece that if you've been more of a traditional long-term care um, aging services provider, it's not something you've had. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece that the grant can cover. Um, I should mention that's a good point, Rebecca. So say that you're starting at that first level, right? There is a cost and I believe it's, I believe it's $3,500 um, to start for the initial engagement and then the full accreditation but then there is funding throughout the state um, through the state for the, the next levels of accreditation we have some funding set aside so as long as that's available there is assistance for the cost for the cql accreditation some agencies have began at the second level um, because they already are serving a large population or um, they really have a lot of the policies in place so it, it cql helps determine that so that's a good point thanks rebecca for bringing that up Okay. All right. Well, that's all. We have. I just, I am so thankful for Erica and her willingness and ability to talk about this. Yeah. And thankful that we have yes. these services in North Dakota. These, these are very new. You know, mm -hmm. as Erica said, she's new to her position. The all of these services that she really talked about. I mean, the general aging services and aging disability resource link. Those have been existing for quite a while. Um, and, uh, you know, are ongoing, but the, the residential habilitation and that, you know, potential of agency foster care, those are really services that came out of, what, the 2017 legislative session, is that correct, Erica, or was it 2019? Was it 19, 19, 19. 19. So mm -hmm. even more new than I'm thinking in my brain, my yeah. time you know, has gotten really a little warped, but so, yeah, so they've really been around for a very short amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. They've, you know, and one of the things that's made Erica's job even more difficult is they, yeah, they came out of 2019 session. And then once they went through the whole, like designing them and writing them up and getting permission from federal Medicaid, that the state was really ready to like roll out the launch of these right as COVID was hitting. Yep. So um, that's when it, I was hired, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right around when yeah. you were hired. So it, it yep. has been just a really short period of time, but mm -hmm. they are great services and were services really designed with the brain injury population in mind and how to meet some of that kind of unmet gap needs that we have. Wow. So thank you so much, Erica. We appreciate your time and we appreciate, you know, the, the ongoing work that you do for these developing these services. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys so much. That's a big deal. Thank you. So if anybody has any questions, Erica's all of her information is there. She is more than happy to, it's it's her job to really handhold through, you know, this. If you are interested in, you know, becoming, providing any of these services, don't know where to start, whatever, feel free. You can reach out to us at any bin. But also part of the reason why we had Erica here is Erica would be your, um, you know, resource to really answer all the ins and outs questions and navigate that for you. I was just going to mention, I'm Jenny, I'm one of the HCVS case managers, and I hopped on here because I knew Erica was presenting. And uh, even though I've heard, you know, the spiel about these programs, I, I even took more notes today because it's just a lot of information. So I just wanted to jump on and hear it once again. <laughs> I saw yeah. that. I'm glad you jumped on just because it is so new um, for the case managers as well. So it probably wouldn't hurt to present to them again either. Right, Jenny? <laughs> so, yep. 
We're all learning. <laughs> We're all learning. And I think because of that, for right now, the, a lot of the cases that we have worked on, it has been a, a build as we go case. Mm -hmm. you know? Very it, much it's so. It's not something where we have a, you know, kind of existing hole in services like a bed or whatever that can just be automatically filled. It's more, uh, okay, we have an individual that needs services. How do we, you know, start finding a provider, that provider do the hiring, do the, you know, so, so it really is kind of a custom building of services right now. Hopefully we'll get to a point that we're, we're past that. Um, right. But it also is nice that it, it's, it's allowing that kind of custom of building of services for individuals. I just submitted my 1915i Medicaid waiver. Oh, so, fabulous. Yeah, I'm, I, I can't wait to see, because the people here in Dickinson are amazing. Um, with everything I've went through with them, so I know that this process, I'm happy to be a guinea pig. It'll be really fun to um, go through it and, and see what kind of, you know, how much more I can progress. Great. It is attitudes like that. I mean, part of this yeah. is we are building a system. So you have to, you know, as you said, Michael, you kind of have to be willing to be a little bit of a guinea pig, a little bit of how does this all go and how do all these services fit together? Yep. And I'm happy to do it. Yeah, seriously. So, yeah. It makes me happy. And just how progressive this state is being, how how willing we are to try new things and how helpful we're trying to be to people we just didn't know were there or we didn't have here yet. So this is from somebody who's a, a survivor, an overcomer, and someone who, who would love to help other people avoid some of the challenges I have, I, I, can, I look forward to this. This is really exciting information, and I'm so grateful. This was Thank a great you. webinar Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank uh, you. Yes. All right, All right I got to go now. Have a great rest <laughs> of the day. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>